Keeping Southern Maryland connected. Here's T-Bone and Heather on Star 98.3 and 97.7 The Bay. That is what we're up to every single morning. It's a full-time job, let me tell you. Uh, joining us on the phone lines this morning is Dr. Polsky. Hey, doctor, how are you, sir? Good morning and welcome to stage two. Or hey. I will refer to it stage 1D today. <laughs> Hey, good. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, well, I'm I'm equal parts excited and a little apprehensive, I guess. Uh, where are you on this? What's what's your emotional scale? Uh, I'm certainly encouraged that we keep moving in a good direction. Uh, aside from what uh, the governor announced yesterday, uh, I'm happy to see that at least in our county, and I haven't seen the most recent stats in Charles and St. Mary's yet. Uh, but we continue to see a, a consistent, gradual trending down in infections. Excellent. Oh, that's awesome news. Hey, well, I, I got a call from a gentleman, Dr. Polsky, and I don't know if you can answer this because you're in Calvert County, but maybe you've had a sense of it and you've you know heard in the, you know, the, the, the rooms there uh, when people are talking about things going on. Um, he has a friend who is in a nursing home. And the nursing home is in La Plata. But he would like to know when it would be possible to go visit his friend because mm. he hasn't been able to visit in months. And he's just wondering when when that will be lifted or is that an individual thing per nursing home? My suspicion is that that will be toward the very end of lifting restrictions. I, I think we're all aware of, uh, I almost hate to use the term, but just uh, tinder boxes that, that nursing homes have been in various uh, locations across the state. Right, right. Almost half of the deaths across the state have occurred in nursing homes. Uh, and, you know, the, the reality is that it's such a confined population that once the virus gets in, it's very, very difficult to control things. And generally it's not, uh, the you know, given the age of the people there, they're not, you know, tip-top health either. Well, and, and most people, it's not just their age, but it's their age and their inability to care for themselves, which oftentimes means that they have multiple underlying health conditions. Yeah. So pro- probably not for a while still. I, I think so, and I, that would be a, a, a great uh, area for virtual technology. That I know that's not nearly the same as being there in person. But it's a great idea, yeah. So yeah. Somebody could Skype, maybe a nurse there could Skype, and yeah, he sounded like he missed his friend, so well, I felt bad for let him. Let me ask you this, Doctor. Uh, so we've been taking calls this morning, and I've been kind of surprised by the responses we've uh, received. Um and this, hap- this is uh, the result of a conversation I had over the weekend. I'm talking with some friends, and uh, the, the subject of a vaccine came out. Now, Dr. Fauci said, listen, by the beginning of next year, 2021, we should have around 200 million doses of vaccine ready to go. Um, so before he said that, I was having a conversation this past weekend with, with some folks, and they're like, I don't even care if they get a vaccine. I'm not, getting, I'm not taking that vaccine. Um, are you, doctor, are you, if a vaccine came out and it's ready, would you get the vaccine? Yes. I, I, I know there's a lot of hypothetical at this point. Uh, and that it's, it, everybody's talking in the abstract uh, that once we get to a point, it's not just going to be a, a lot of uh, just uh, kind of fluff and then all of a sudden we have a vaccine the next day. So there are going to be updates uh, as to what the preliminary testing, uh, at each stage of the testing, what it's showing, um, how, how uh, effective it is. Uh, they'll talk about for the people who have received in the trials, uh, what if any side effects have occurred. Uh, and also to keep in mind that that's going to be at least seven, eight, ten months from now that we will understand more and more about the virus itself. So, you know, trying to make a decision right now on, on a personal basis as to whether any individual is going to get it for themselves, is going to have the child vac- vaccinated. Um, this is not the, for, for those who are struggling right now and are, are concerned. This is not the time to start to, uh, you know, to kind of ossify to to, to 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 harden their decision on things. They should keep a very open mind, uh, watch and listen as we actually get good um, evidence and reports, and then as we get into winter or um, into early next year. That's the time where you start making your decision. Yeah, I don't think they have an open mind. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they seem pretty set in their ways. Hey, hey, let me ask you this, because a listener also brought this to my attention, and, and I, I, I am not really familiar with the process, and if it's a viable process. What about injecting antibodies? Is that something for people who've already had it? 
and you take the plasma. Is there a way to that I could just get injected with antibodies and I would be good to go? So uh, that's already being done. That's uh, the uh, fancy term is convalescent serum. Oh, uh, and so uh, there uh, for people who have already had the infection and have had high levels of antibody, uh, you can extract out. It's not. Uh, whole blood, but it's the serum. So if anybody's ever seen a tube of blood uh, separate, it's the um, kind of straw colored yellow or stuff yellow on top. The yeah. Cells are. Uh, and that's where the antibodies are concentrated. So there, there um, have been trials, and, and I know uh, a small number of patients at Calvert Hospital have gotten some convalescent serum to this point. Uh, but at this point, we don't know how effective that's going to be because the number of people treated were very small. And at that point, you're already sick. Are they in a trial? Oh, the fo- you're already sick at oh, that point. Oh, you're already right. sick. That's very, very different than a vaccine where you're preventing someone from getting infected in the first place. And, of course... Why do you wait till they're already sick? Well, uh, so they, the antibodies only last for a very short period of time once they, uh, once they go into the recipient. So the, they're only going to last for a few hours to a day. Oh. And, oh. And then they go away. So unless the virus, what, what those antibodies do is they latch on to the virus and essentially incapacitate the virus or weaken it to the point where it's hard for that virus to attach on to the cells in the body and cause an infection or worsen the infection. I shouldn't say cause, but worsen the infection. Uh, and, and so it, it buys time for that person's immune system to catch up with the rest of the infection oh. and start to heal the person's body. Hmm. It doesn't linger for days or weeks or months. So once somebody gets that... It's not like a vaccine. Term, yeah. Correct. So what a, what a vaccine does is it boosts, it, it, it allows your, your immune system to recognize that this is a foreign uh, an invader. Uh, and uh, once your immune system recognizes that, it retains what we refer to as memory. Uh, so that the next time your body comes in contact with it, instead of taking the usual week or 10 days to mount an immune response, uh, your immune system kicks in immediately within hours. You start producing your own antibodies against the virus, and then your body can kill off that virus before it actually causes infection. You make medicine sound complicated. (laughs) Um, All right. Well, well, that's interesting. So uh, we're in... We're in state. Well, we're technically, I guess, tomorrow we're in stage two. Right. Um, do you, do you, from a from a hospital standpoint, is it? Do you gear up differently as we move into a different stage, or you're just like, well, let's just see what where we're at. For the hospitals, nothing has really changed this point with what the governor uh, issued yesterday. So there were two things: the governor had a press conference and uh, and, and talked about various aspects with uh, coronavirus, and then. Uh, after that, there are actual orders issued as far as what can open, what needs to stay closed. Nothing changed in terms of hospitals. So uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, most of the hospitals in the state began to allow a limited number of elective procedures. Uh, and uh, as a result of what the governor announced yesterday, that won't change. Do you guys, uh, as a doctor, I'm just I'm curious, I'm going to circle back to the vaccine thing. Uh, as a doctor, are you guys required to get vaccinated, or do you still have the option of going, eh, I'm not doing that? So there's two aspects. One is uh, what uh, might be required by the organization you work for, mm-hmm. and then the other is you have an ethical obligation to get vaccinated. So uh, for the flu, uh, most hospitals, almost all hospitals starting about seven, eight years ago, began requiring that any employee, not just physicians and nurses, but all employees there, get flu vaccines. And the goal there was to make sure that they were not going to then pass the, the flu on to patients in, in the hospital. Right. So it became a condition for employment at a hospital uh, was getting a vaccine. But aside from that, because not all doctors and nurses work in hospitals, I, I think that healthcare professionals have an ethical obligation uh, to get vaccinated. And there are really two components to that. One is, again, you do not want to inadvertently infect the patients that you're supposed to care for and heal. But the other is there's a limited number of nurses and doctors out there. Right. If you have a whole lot of nurses and doctors getting sick in a relatively short period of time, who's taking care of patients? Right. Hey, doctor, let me ask you this about restaurants. Um, I know uh, the stage 1.2 that happened last week, uh, outdoor dining and things like that. I know the health department pays attention to, you know, what's going on with the restaurants. When do you think restaurants will be able to open and have people actually sitting indoors? and be able to have a meal inside? 
I wish I could give you an answer. That, uh, those are decisions that are being made up in Annapolis, uh, and uh, we find out when you find out. Well, let me ask you a follow-up to that. Let's say, uh, and I'm only asking, and again, I know this is, everything's different, but let's say you're, you're at, or they decide at some point, okay, yeah, you can go back into the restaurant. So there you are, you're sitting in a restaurant. Let's say you're the only one in there. So other people's not a factor. Um, here comes the plate of food. It sits down. What is the likelihood that that virus could be on the fork? It, it, or how how dangerous is that? Do you need to take a little piece of Clorox and wipe everything down before you eat? We're not worried about that. And the main reason is that for decades and decades and decades, we've had very strict regulations of how restaurants operate. Uh, so uh, in each county, uh, the health department has an environmental health staff, and, and uh, a part of that health staff is devoted solely to inspecting restaurants. There are just a litany of rules that restaurants need to go by, uh, special training for all their staff to make sure that not just with coronavirus, but we worry much more about things like E. coli and salmonella uh, in, in restaurant settings that uh, we're not going to end up having workers who can pass on infections to other people, and, um, and, and particularly the way that uh, all the equipment, including the plates and the forks and everything else, are sanitized. Would you have any concerns if a, a, a couple of weeks from now they open up restaurants and there's Dr. Polsky uh, out uh, having dinner, would you have any concerns about... Uh, the, the touching the plate and the table and the forks and all that kind of stuff? No, I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. Really, for, for coronavirus, for, for COVID, what we're going to be continue to be concerned about is the potential for transmission from human being to human being. Okay. All right. All right. Respiratory. Respiratory well, All right. Here we are. Stage two. Well, pretty much. And uh, we'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see how it goes. You got time to check in with us next week? I, I will do my best. I've been trying to block time every week. Yeah. You know, things are just a little... What unfair. could be more important than us? <laughs> I, I don't see anything out there that's more important than us. Um, all right, listen, if you got time, we'll chat next week. We would love it. All right, take Do- care. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Polsky. I still don't think he gets me. I still, I still don't <laughs> he think... He doesn't. I don't think he gets oh, me. Oh, I think he gets you. I think he thinks you're <laughs> nuts. I think he gets you perfectly. You, so, what you're, so what you're saying is, you think he gets me, he thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ah, ah, that might be it right exactly. there. Exactly. I hadn't factored that in. Uh, 19 minutes after 8 o'clock, 8, 19, our phone lines are open for you if you want to be part of the show this morning. That's fantastic. We love to chat with you. Um, so here's the reason I asked that question. So the other day... Uh, I, I what, decided the restaurant question. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the other day, I decided uh, I'm going to uh, go through drive-through and get uh, get a little bite to eat. We haven't gone through drive-through, and oh my gosh, I, I don't even. I can't even tell you the last time. No. So anyway, I go through the whole thing, go up to the window, pay, get the food. I'm driving off, and um, I I just hadn't had a meal prepared by anybody but Heather mm-hmm. in I don't know how long, and it, so then I was like. Huh. Okay. Well, I guess it's. Uh, I'm sure it's fine. I mean, it's fine. It's it's got to be fine. Right. And then so that's what I was thinking about. Okay. So you're sitting there at the table. Yeah. You got your 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 forearms on the table. Yeah. There's the plate and the fork and so on and so forth. And here comes the food. And you know, what is the likelihood that you're going to be picking up that fork? And, and putting it in your mouth, and then, oh, are you going to get sick? And then actually the likelihood is very, 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 very almost ridiculously too small to even talk about. Good. Uh, which is good. Good right. question. Good. Right. Well, yeah, because pe- you need we to We need be- to open these restaurants up. I mean, they are the lifeblood of a community. They are. They, and the bars and the just – People need up. to be confident that when they go out – right. And they're sitting in that restaurant or they're sitting in that bar or they're doing whatever they're doing that just by the fact that they're there, that doesn't, you know, that's not really raising the risk that high. It's still the person to person that, you know, it's still the social distancing. It's still the person to person contact that you need to be aware of. Not so much. Oh, my God, I'm picking up a fork. Who touched this fork before me kind of thing? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. That's, right. That shouldn't be the thing that's uh, keeping you from going out, having some fun, and, you know, 
having a life again. Uh, 821, phone lines are open for you if you want to be part of the show this morning. 1-800-STAR-983. That's 1-800-782-7983 if you're listening on Star. And if you're listening on 97.7 The Bay, it's 301-884-4615. Either station you call into, you're going to be on both stations. Mm -hmm. So twice the coverage, which is fun. So give us a call, 301-884-4615 or... 1-800-782-7983, as we are set to move into phase two. Yeah, stage two. Looking forward to it. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty exciting.